there must always be a Thor. Whether wielding Mjolnir, channeling Thunder, or contemplating other heroes as an ensemble, there is no denying that Thor packs a punch. He is arguably the strongest Avenger, with an even stronger heir to his power, Dr. Jane Foster. While initially introduced as nothing more than a love interest, Jane Foster has seen astronomical growth in recent years in terms of her characterization and capabilities within the Marvel canon. Specifically, she is deemed worthy by Mjolnir following the Hammer's apparent rejection of the original Thor, embarking on a journey both mental and physical in his trials and tribulations. She faces cancer while fighting giants, she bests chemo while brutalizing gods, and she burrows into readers' hearts with her steadfast will to do the right thing. Who is Jane Foster? So for those who need a primer, Jane Foster first appeared in 1962, courtesy of Larry Leiber and Jack Kirby's Journey into Mystery number 84. While Thor goes about his civilian endeavors, he maintains the identity of Dr. Donald Blake and practices medicine. War breaks out in the South American country of San Diablo, resulting in a shortage of medical personnel and rising rates of sickness and injury in the peasant population. Thor, as Blake, goes to the ravaged country to assist. He hires Jane as his nurse, both in his professional and personal life, and she accompanies him to San Diablo. While en route to the country from America, Blake and Foster's transport is attacked by the Executioner, the leader of one of the factions involved in San Diablo's war. Thanks to Thor's timely intervention, however, the planes bombarding the ship are destroyed and sufficient medical aid reaches South American shores. The Executioner does not want to see the lower class recover though, and sends an entire platoon to take out the doctors and nurses instead. Thor fights his force off as well, but Jane is taken hostage, prompting Thor to transform back into Donald Blake and attempt to negotiate her release. Things quickly turn sour and Blake is put in front of the Executioner's firing squad, only to successfully get the villain to combat the seemingly handicapped doctor, Mono and Mono. I think you guys see where this is going. Surprise! Here comes Thor to save the day by forcing a volcano to erupt, thereby sending the Executioner's forces fleeing for their lives. No sooner does Executioner flee the opposing faction, a force of democratic revolutionaries arrives to collect his soldiers. Thor saves the day, Jane is rescued, and on top of all that, no one suspects Blake is actually the thunder-wielding god himself. The two decide to return to America thanks to the war's end, but Jane can't help but wonder aloud, By the way, Doctor, where were you while all the fighting was going on? It trips Blake up. I was, uh, hiding behind the execution wall. I figured it was the safest place to be. Jane is left to wonder why her boss can't be as dashing or heroic as Thor, and I'm left to wonder, is there no such thing as irony on this earth? Cut to 2013's Thor God of Thunder number 12, and Jane seems to be in dire straits, perhaps even on her way out of Thor's orbit. She is diagnosed with breast cancer, and earns Thor's sympathy. He is understandably aghast as to how he cannot simply bludgeon her cancer to death, but she faces the terrifying disease with immeasurable dignity. Her head held high, Thor calls her a brave woman, to which she responds, Nope, just a regular woman. This is just something women do. Perhaps a fitting indication of her future as a god of thunder. Given her rather standard introductory story, it's impressive how far Jane has come as a character since. Sure, she does still serve as Thor's better half from time to time, but Jane has grown into a proper superhero in her own right. Though most of this development has been recent, Jane's potential is perhaps heralded roughly 16 years after her debut in the pages of What If. Stick around to our interlude and we'll touch upon the earliest adventure of the mighty Thor in the form of this heroic variant. But before we get into the thunderous theatrics of Thor, make sure to drop a like on the video and subscribe to get some plot armor today. This is a brand new channel and we appreciate all the support we can get. Chapter 1 If She Be Worthy the state of things in the Marvel Universe is uncertain around the time Jane takes up the mantle as Thor. The events of Original Sin have left Thor in shambles as Nick Fury, taking on the role of the Unseen, essentially renders him unworthy of wielding Mjolnir due to the God of Thunder's own trepidations about his godhood. This is all done through a whisper, Fury imparting such consequential words in a hushed tone. Therefore, Mjolnir is parked on the blue side of the moon, and Thor sits before it, floundering in frustration and despair at his newfound predicament. It's a pitiful sight as Thor whispers to Mjolnir, pleading with it to return to his grasp. In the meantime, his father Odin has returned to Asgard and once again takes up the throne. The Allfather seeks out his progeny on the moon, and upon learning of the situation, casts the dejected Odin son aside to pick up Mjolnir himself. After all, it was Odin who cast the initial enchantment that defines the hammer. Whosoever holds his hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. Alas, not even the great Odin can pick up Mjolnir, leaving the Warriors 3 to conclude that it must have something to do with the hammer itself, rather than the worthiness of the wielder. 
However, the situation takes a backseat as news of a frost giant attack on Earth reaches the Asgardians. Odin orders his people to return to their home, while Freya counters with a march to war on Earth. After Odin scolds her and Thor flies off to the Hall of Weapons, Freya is left alone on the moon. Before she goes though, she eyes Mjolnir for a moment. This ends up foreshadowing Mjolnir's next visitor. It's not revealed exactly who this person is, but readers are given a small hint. As they take the hammer into their grasp, Odin's inscription on it changes. Whosoever holds this hammer, if she be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. As things escalate on Earth with Malekith the Accursed leading the Frost Giants, the new Thor joins the battle while simultaneously defending herself from the old Thor, now calling himself Odin's son. Thor demonstrates many of the same abilities as her predecessor, such as lightning manipulation and command of Mjolnir, though the latter is significantly more independent in her hands. This is more than likely due to the fact that Mjolnir possesses within itself a powerful cosmic storm, the god Tempest, that Odin imprisoned within the hammer's material millennia ago. Further, Thor has immense physical strength, as well as healing abilities, which serve her well in her tussle with Odin's son. The two heroes subsequently make peace when the latter observes Mjolnir's behavior when wielded by the former, careening about on the battlefield like it has a mind of its own. As the combined forces of both Thor and Odin's son bring the Frost Giant invasion to a close, Odin sets about recovering Mjolnir from this new female Thor, whom he now considers an imposter. If the plight of women isn't plainly illustrated by this development, Odin's deployment of a destroyer to capture Thor should do the trick. However, her status is confirmed when Odin's son, Freya, Sif, and many other female heroes of the Marvel Universe arrive to back her up against the Destroyer. It's an epic moment that acts as a meta-commentary on this new Thor. She has the vote of approval of not only the original, but every other character readers care about. They dispatch the Destroyer, or rather Freya does, and everyone returns home, including Thor. One final question remains for viewers. Who is the new Thor? As she looks out upon the star she guards, her Thor facade falls away, and Jane Foster, sickly from cancer, yet undoubtedly strong in character, stands in her place. A quote from Captain America of all people comes to mind when observing this scene. A strong man who has known power all his life may lose respect for that power, but a weak man knows the value of strength and knows compassion. Chapter 2 Leader of Thors Not long after initially wielding the hammer, Jane finds herself in a rather unusual crisis. The final incursion, where the mainstream Marvel Universe known as Earth-616 is beginning to collide with the Ultimate Universe, Earth-1610. The Ultimate Nick Fury orders shields to the Manhattan of Earth-616, and a massive battle ensues, with the 616 heroes attempting to fend off their invading counterparts. However, other heroes are prepared for the worst, including 616's Reed Richards, who decides to put together a small team of humanity's powerful to survive in a life raft, a facility that narrowly escapes this final incursion. Thor is among the heroes transported aboard, including the likes of Captain Marvel, Spider-Man, and Star-Lord. They are later found by Doctor Strange, now known as Sheriff Strange in the new reality post-incursion, along with a life raft from the Ultimate Universe containing Miles Morales. Strange brings Miles to his stronghold where he introduces him to the survivors of Earth-616. It is explained that their current home, Battle World, was created by Doctor Doom, who is now essentially the god of this new reality. God Emperor Doom faces opposition when the Cabal, a more villainous version of the Illuminati led by Namor, and the Thor Corps, a multiversal collection of Thors from different realities, engage in battle. Doom teleports into battle and easily murders the Phoenix-empowered Scott Summers. It is a shocking moment that cements the stakes of battle world and the conflict the reality displaced heroes find themselves in. This lands for not only readers, but Strange, who disperses the heroes across the realm of battle world to escape Doom's wrath. He gives his life for this effort, but is successful. Thor proceeds to infiltrate the Thor Corps as one of their members. I mean, she arguably had the easiest time blending in. In comparison, Captain Marvel ended up being captured by Mr. Sinister's forces, and the rest is placed across an unfamiliar and hostile realm. The descent in Battle World continues to grow as Doom hunts down the multiversal interlopers. He frames them for the murder of Sheriff Strange, further fueling a toxic stew of distrust between the residents of his domain. Within the Hall of the Thors, the various iterations of the God of Thunder engage in heated debate and fisticuffs over whether believing in doom or rebelling is the right thing to do. Jane takes up the fight herself, imploring her fellow Thors. Brothers, sisters, you know in your hearts that my words are true. You have been deceived. God Doom is not great. He is not even good. So who will come with me and do battle? 
And so, with a small contingent of Thors guarding the hall, Jane leads the Thor Corps to Doom's castle, where the other residents of Battleworld has similarly decided to overthrow the despot. The conflict is brought to an end when Mr. Fantastic resorts the Marvel Universe following a fight with Doom. Following her triumphant adventure as a multiversal revolutionary, Jane returns home to her day-to-day -day life on Earth 616, sitting for yet another round of chemo. Interlude. What if? So where did this idea of Jane Foster becoming Thor come from exactly? As with most alternative takes on popular Marvel characters, this idea came about in the company's immensely popular anthology series, What If? Writer Don Glunt and artist Rick Hoberg tackled an interesting question with issue number 10, particularly given the historical time of its release in 1978 by answering the question, what if Jane Foster had found the hammer of Thor? To accomplish his remix of Origins, Glunt and Hoberg only needed to change one thing about Donald Blake's discovery of Mjolnir all those years ago. Instead of his visiting Norway alone as he did in his comics debut, Jane accompanies him. The stone men from Saturn that Thor combats in Journey into Mystery number 83 still appear here, but while Blake Blake and Foster flee, the former drops his cane down a steep hill. Jane descends the hill to recover the cane and is separated from Blake. Instructing Donald to hide between some rocks, Jane ventures into a nearby cave only to discover a seemingly harmless wooden stick within. With the exit blocked by a boulder, Jane attempts to leverage the stick to move the giant rock, but it is hopeless. Frustrated, she bashes the stick against the boulder and finds herself transformed into the mighty Thor. She christens herself Thordis and saves Blake from the stone men, all while keeping her newfound identity a secret from him. Subsequently, Jane embarks on a short but worthwhile trip across Thor's earliest Marvel adventures, including conflicts with Loki, the Kingdom of Asgard, Radioactive Man, and the God of Thunder's membership in the Avengers. And each of these encounters is filtered through the lens of femininity. Jane's experience of these formative events is categorically different from Donald Blake's, unapologetically informed by her gender. Thordis demonstrates a fearless rebuttal both literally and figuratively to the mold of a hero that is being forced on her by the characters around her. In this way, perhaps it is fitting that Jane Foster's Thor would be instituted in the Marvel canon later. She is a pioneering character for leading Marvel ladies and deserves to continue breaking new ground with Mjolnir for the foreseeable future. Chapter 3 The War of Realms With the Marvel Universe restored following the final incursion, Jane returns to Asgard to serve as a senator in the Congress of Worlds, as well as her secret role as Thor. Accompanied by her guardsman Volstag, Jane is receiving a chemotherapy treatment when Rock's news covers a disturbing event occurring in outer orbit. The corpses of Light Elves, inhabitants of Alfheim, graffitied with a terrifying declaration. So begins the War of Realms. The sudden onslaught of bodies causes Rock's news' weather tracking satellite base to lose its orbit and begin plummeting towards Washington, D.C. Jane becomes Thor and manages to safely land the falling base in the reflecting pool, attracting the attention of other prominent Avengers who were hoping to help. She then investigates the unfortunate souls buried in orbit, which inspires her to reflect on her condition. She ponders her transformations into Thor in simple yet incisive language. The transformation neutralizes the effects of the chemotherapy. It purges the poison from my body, but not the cancer, because cancer is just another part of me now. This is the central dilemma of Jane Foster's Thor, in possession of such immense power, but nevertheless confined to a mortal shell. And through her continued chemo treatments, Jane is consistently reminded of said mortality. After she saves the satellite base, Jane makes her way to Asgard to attend a meeting of the Congress of Worlds, where she is immediately faced with false Thor signs all over the kingdom. Odin is continuing his war against the new Thor, and a causality of this campaign of his is his own wife Freya being imprisoned on charges of treason. Thor subsequently joins the battle between Alfheim and the Dark Elves' realm, Svartalheim, but it is brought to an end when Malekith hypnotizes the Light Elf Queen and marries her, designating him the King of the Elves. Her attention now required at home, Thor intervenes in the trial of Freya alongside the double-timing Loki and proceeds to combat Odin across planets and moons. In one specific attack, Thor uses the Great Red Spot, a massive storm on Jupiter, to fight the Allfather back. To be fair, he did throw her into the spot to begin with. Jane seems to both allow and discourage herself from enjoying the event. War in Alfheim, civil war in Asgard, when even the elves and immortals can't keep their houses in order, what the hell kind of hope do the rest of us have? Then again, when you're a 90 pound woman dying of cancer, it does feel pretty good to punch God in the face. The duel is brought to an end when Freya is stabbed in the back by Loki, enrapturing Odin's attention mid-contest and compelling him to return to see his murdered wife. A somber end, but the Marvel Universe shouldn't fear. Thor remains in defiance of the dark days ahead. One guardian who soars above them all. Her name is Thor, and like it or not, she's not going anywhere. Chapter 4 You got a friend in me 
The Chitari set their sights on the potential resources of Earth, in particular the inhabitants, and sent Warbringer to begin laying the foundation for their imminent conquest. The alien approaches the owner of the former Avengers Tower, Mr. Gryphon, and gains his aid, but the two are not as alone as they initially thought. Nearby, Spider-Man becomes privy to the two's machinations, but is quickly found out. Warbringer retaliates, but the commotion gains the attention of a couple of supers nearby. Captain America and Iron Man, who immediately move to assist the young hero. The trio, along with Nova and Miss Marvel, go to battle with the Chitauri until he reveals his endgame, to mine the planet for people as they serve as sustenance for the aliens. Warbringer descends into the subway tunnels and seems to gain some ground on the heroes. Q Thor arriving in force and very nearly killing the heroes via a misguided Mjolnir throw. Warbringer's ally Gryphon assists him by placing a portal between the alien and Mjolnir and transporting it behind him thereby directing its impact against the tunnel wall. The force of the hammer ruptures the concrete, causing the water of the river to immediately come rushing in. As Warbringer ascends to safety, the heroes are left to face the mad current of the tsunami overtaking them. Thor rescues Nova while Vision gets Miss Marvel and Iron Man handles Spidey. The heroes resolve to pursue Warbringer together and move to Long Island, where the Chitauri has opened a portal in the sky to allow more of its army through. The heroes stave off the undead forces of Mr. Gryphon as well as the invading army, and devise a plan to send Warbringer through the hole he opened up as he is too powerful for the team to overcome. With Spider-Man standing by to shut the portal, Nova shoves Warbringer through. Back on the ground, the heroes decide to officially form a new Avengers team, assuaging Tony's apprehension from earlier in the story. But Jane's life begins to grow severely complicated during her subsequent time with Earth's Mightiest. When Cyclone attacks Atlantic City by conjuring up a massive hurricane, the Avengers respond, with Captain America and Thor finding common ground in a shared predicament. They are both not considered the real ones of their respective costume identities. After all, both characters are not the original bearers of their mantles, despite carving out legacies in their own right. Sam speaks of his frustration with this particular cross the bear, but in an admittedly steamy panel, Jane assures Cap with a surprise kiss. She then beseeches him, always act on your impulses, Sam Wilson. Life's candle burns too briefly not to live in the moment. And then she leaves. Talk about a tease. The remaining heroes are left to wonder for the umpteen time, just who is Thor? However, one of these heroes will actually receive an answer. During the team's climactic battle with Gryphon's real identity, Kang the Conqueror, Thor and Cap are sent into the future, but with a hitch. The former is consequently separated from Mjolnir. This causes her to revert back to Jane in the presence of Sam, making him the first character to know the identity of the mighty Thor. Dodging bullets left and right, Sam tries to shield Jane while flying her back to Mjolnir, but they are shot down before reaching it. The impact knocks Jane out cold, though Sam stays by her side as the fight commences around them. In a desperate attempt to get Thor back, Sam takes Jane's hand and places it on the hammer's hilt. Readers are wrenched from this emotional moment to the heat of the war as Iron Man duels with Vision. But the sight of Mjolnir and Cap's shield hurtling towards Kang side by side only adds to the anticipation as Jane, recovered as the mighty Thor, triumphantly proclaims, Avengers! Assemble! Thor proceeds to finish the fight by grabbing the past version of Mjolnir that she had earlier been separated from and her current Mjolnir and slamming them together, sending Kang careening through time. Her time as a hero on pause, Jane once again returns to chemotherapy, but finds she has made a friend. Sam having understandably grown fond of the ailing doctor. And I'm sure that kiss had something to do with it too. Chapter 5 Heroes Hydra Hecla Jane's time with the Avengers grows more complicated when her fellow hero Iron Man sends out an SOS for assistance in Washington, D.C. The evil organization Hydra has begun a hostile takeover of the United States, and Thor answers the call with Mjolnir by her side. The Avengers and the Champions fight side by side, but all the heroes are stopped in their tracks when the leader of Hydra is revealed, Captain America, or a Captain America. The Avengers recognize him as Steve Rogers, so much so that Thor initially declares him a traitor. But before she can even finish her initial battle cry, Thor fades away, leaving behind Mjolnir. If it wasn't already a shocking scene with Captain America at the head of Hydra's leading ensemble, readers receive another jolt when the imposter Cap strides forward, nary a worry paid to the other combatants of the field, and lifts the hammer. The narration is haunting as it memorializes the moment. With the world slipping away around us, we graze into the face of our enemy, finally seeing them for what they really are. They were stronger. 
they were more powerful. In that moment, they were worthy. But Thor isn't out of the fight just yet. She wakes up in another dimension, finding herself in the company of a farmer named Hecla. Recounting her story to the farmer, Thor managed to elicit Hecla's sympathies, even constructing a hammer for her to deploy in battle. The two embark on a quest through the vicious fields of the mud pits to find a device that can return her home. As they travel, Hecla and Thor develop a friendly rapport, which combined with the latter's command of lightning, fuels the former's fervor for Jane's power. They ultimately confront the villainous Yod, an interdimensional being capable of feats beyond Hecla and her people's capability to respond. Subjugating Hecla's world, Yod lives only to centralize his power, but is in possession of the device that can traverse dimensions. Thor fights Yod, but during the course of the duel, Hecla is mortally wounded by the villain. Thor then uses the weapon her new friend made for her to smash Yod's power source to smithereens, declaring, I strike not for Asgard, not for Earth, but for my friend. As a final farewell, she uses the device who sent Hecla to his version of a beyond where Yod never invaded and his family still drew breath. He reflects on his brief time with Thor and comes to a warm conclusion. Whether or not she truly was a god, I will never know. All I know is that she was my friend. Upon returning to her home dimension, Thor wasted no time in striking back against Hydra and fittingly in the exact same place that she was first whisked away, Washington DC. This fight doesn't last long, especially once the original Steve Rogers returns and does away with his evil counterpart Hydra Supreme, using Mjolnir no less. Rogers returns the hammer to Thor along with giving the shield back to Sam Wilson and the Avengers reign over a new era of peace as Earth's might his heroes. Chapter 6, The Mighty Must Fall. Jane's final battle as Thor is the one she and readers knew was coming, yet remained unprepared for. The constant transformations to and from Thor have healed Jane's body of toxins, including the chemotherapy drugs meant to keep her cancer at bay. However, cancer remains and even progresses. Essentially, the source of Jane's power is also that of her pain. The more she becomes Thor, the faster her cancer evolves. The diagnosis is exceedingly grim and is delivered via an intervention of sorts. Doctor Strange renders a prognosis. On behalf of the people who love and respect you and who refuse to watch you murder yourself, one peal of thunder at a time. As readers may expect, this does not keep Dr. Foster away from heroics for long, taking up the hammer one final time in a bid to save Asgard from its destruction. The perpetrator? Mangog, the physical embodiment of an ancient race's hatred towards the gods after being wiped out. Given the age of the creature, the actual reason this race was wiped out is lost to legend, but nevertheless, he's coming for Thor's home. She flies home and engages the beast in a battle sprawling the stars, at one point hurling the monster into the sun. Incredibly, this does not stop the Mangog as he returns with a vengeance, leaving Thor no other choice. Her home needs a hero, a role which in turn requires sacrifice. In her final act as the mighty Thor, Jane Foster ascends to this lofty criterion by sending Mjolnir, with Mangog secured via leather harness back into the sun. Thus fell Mjolnir and the Thor who commanded it. Jane collapses in Odin's son's arms on the moon, concluding her journey where it began. In a touching send-off, she visits Valhalla, the resting place of the Norse pantheon that Thor, Odin, and the rest of the Asgardian gods belong to. She speaks with Odin's son and both reminisce about their time as Thor and with the ever-faithful Mjolnir. As she hands Odin's son a small fragment of the hammer, she encourages him to continue battling as a god of thunder. I showed you what I can be with that hammer in my hand. Now show me what you can be without it. Show us all. Odin's son and his father utilize the god Tempest, the ancient storm contained within Mjolnir, to revive Jane. With her time as Thor at an end, the good doctor assures Odin's son that she will be a good patient, faithfully reporting to her chemo treatments. Her greatest battle, it seems, has only just begun. Jane Foster, even when confronted by her mortality in the form of cancer, resolves to combat giants, fight chemo, and capture the hearts of every reader who came along for the ride. As a worthy addition to Thor's Thunder's canon, Jane demonstrates why there must always be a Thor. For the universe, and for readers, we can only hope a person as selfless as Dr. Foster is at the helm of life's raging thunderstorms. I have been Slice of Otaku of Plot Armor Comics. Thank you all so much for watching and have an awesome day. I love you.